Good morning, and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Gerald Harris, and I am chair of the Technology and Society Forum, and will be your host today. The focus of the Technology and Society Member Forum is to expose members and attendees to current and emerging developments in science and technology, and in the process, generate thinking and ideas about the use and commercialization of technology in creating a better world for all. We welcome participation from club members and we're delighted to receive your ideas for future programming. Our contact information can be found at the club's website. On behalf of the Commonwealth Club, I would like to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for their support in providing this program and the club's digital communications at this time. I will serve as the moderator of today's program. Our speakers, Dr. Ian Mitroff and Melody Ensign, will both have a chance to speak initially, and then we will op have an open discussion with all of us to entertain your questions. Let me introduce Ian. Ian Mitroff is credited as being one of the principal founders of the modern field of crisis management. He has a BS, MS, and PhD in engineering and a philosophy of social science systems from UC Berkeley. He is a professor emeritus from the Marshall School of Business and an Annenberg School of Communications at USC. Currently, he is a senior research affiliate in the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management at UC Berkeley. He is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Management. He has published 38 books. His most recent is Tech Lash, The Future of Socially Responsible Tech Organization by Springer, New York, 2020. With that, let me welcome Ian Mitroff. Thank you, Gerald. Excellent. Uh, Ian, will you, you, I, I set you up, but you may have a couple of opening comments. So give, give us your, your start as you would like. Well, <clears throat> Let, let me uh, jump into the questions that we talked about before. And let me start with the mindset of technologists because I've been studying this for years. And the, my basic point is this, that the basic skills that are needed to invent a technology are not the same as those that are needed to manage it responsibly. Most of the time, and I hate to say it, technologists get so enamored of their inventions that they overly hype the positive benefits and don't look seriously at the negative downsides. For example, primary among the attributes of the socially responsible tech organization is the ability to focus squarely on the unintended consequences of a technology, how it will be seriously abused and misused by nefarious actors for nefarious ends and to do everything in their power to consider the worst, worst case scenarios and to do what they can to hinder those scenarios from coming true. Now, that means a focus would have to be squarely on proactive crisis management. And one of the things of proactive crisis management is picking up the early warning signs of a potential crisis. The segue, for example, if you look at the coronavirus, there were simulations for a pandemic, but there were no overall simulations for all the other crises that the pandemic would set off, which means one has to think systemically and holistic. One has to look at the social context in which a technology is used. And frankly, and sadly, that's not the purview or the interest of most technologists. Now, I would go so far to say that it needs to be mandated. We can talk more about that later. What uh -huh. would you mean? But that's, that's, that's the opening about the, uh, that's what I find lacking. In the right, mindset. right. It's yeah. a very now, narrow focused intelligence. Yeah, I made, I made one mistake. So let me just track back because I want to also uh, introduce Melanie Ensign, who's here with us as well. So Melanie is a CEO and founder of Discernible, Inc., uh, she has served as the press department lead for DEF CON, which is the world's largest hacker conference. Uh, she was formerly head of security and privacy engineering communications at Uber. 
former security manager at Facebook. Uh, while she was there, she, she was a counselor to the team's uh, uh, executive management team, including the CTO, chief trust security officer, chief privacy officer, and CIO, okay? She holds a degree in communications from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and a master's in science uh, and public relations from Boston University. She will join us right after I um, uh, finish our opening questions with, with Ian. Great. Um, well, let, me, let me just go back and finish sure. the first mm -hmm. thing is that, in fact, Melanie and I were talking about it in preparation. There's actually a disincentive for technologists and most tech companies to think about the broader social consequences of what we're talking about. And that has to be changed. It's no longer acceptable to just dump the latest great techies on humankind and then later clean up their worst after effects. Anyway, that's that's a response to your first mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know when I went through your, your latest book, uh, you expressed some concern about how we, uh, the boundary of integrating the human body with machines and whether we as humans, uh, you know, have the wisdom to really do that or not. Do you want to comment on that in terms of these unknowable risks and, and well, that kind of integration? Yeah. The, the, for the first time in, in human history, although we've done it before to a certain extent, we have the ability to intervene at the genetic le le level of humankind, the human body, and to alter it. Now, a lot of it's done, you know, to prevent Chinese, uh, Chinese doctors did it to prevent childhood disease. Understand that. But the fear of being at close to UC Berkeley, they've invented a technology called CRISPR, and they themselves, the inventors, are worried about the potential crisis that somebody literally in their garage could create a half human monster. Now, the point is, just because we can invent a technology, do we have the wisdom to say it's not always right to do it? And again, that goes back to the first question. How do we merge technical know-how with social wisdom? And to be honest, I don't see very many people working on that and considering it. And that's almost like one of the is along with the virus, God forbid, that is overwhelming us. There's so many things that are overwhelming us, but the management of technology for the betterment of humankind could be greater. Great, great, great. So, you know, sometimes when we look at it, and when I get to uh, Melanie, I'll talk about sort of the, you know, the, the real world here, and I wanted you to sort of give us the largest sort of you know, sort of the, the theoretical, what, what we ought to be doing, how we should think about this. And um, there seem to be some impediments to uh, the social, you know, responsible use of technology. I know one of them I think of is this desire for uh, short-term profits or for, you know, a building market share. Um, but, you know, there are also all these sort of defense mechanisms that exist in these organizations. Can you talk to, to some of those that you... you well, yeah, about. let me give you a background. Um, in 1980, I established the first uh, academic research center for crisis management in the world at USC, the USC Crisis Center. And we had co corporate sponsors not only gave us the money to do our research, but they gave us entree to the organization. I had graduate students go out and interview managers. And they said they would like to do crisis management, but then they began to list all the rationalizations why their top managers would, wouldn't do it. And as I listened to this, since I had a background in psych, the Freudian defense mechanisms came into mind and said, oh my God, there's a direct counterpart. Even though those defense mechanisms were primarily discovered and applied to individuals, they have a counterpart at the organizational level. So for example, denial, that's the primary one. You deny your vulnerability or something won't happen to you at all. Disavow, yes, yeah, something will happen, it'll be minor, we can contain it. So these are all idealization. Grandiosity, oh, we can handle anything. Intellectualization, we're on top of everything. Now here's the thing we found out. I had graduate students do their dissertation on organizations. And what we found, the more that an organization used these defense mechanisms, the more prone it was 
to crisis management. The fewer programs it had being proactive to handle. So yeah, of course, the desire for money is so powerful that it leads people to want to get their technology out as soon as possible and not think about the negatives. But the underlying that, the bigger factor that goes into the culture of an organ, and it is the culture, whether it's a reactive culture, then they will just react to the crisis. And if you react, the data, the studies have shown the research again and again, reactive doesn't work. I mean, the classic example is BT, BP's oil spill in the Gulf. Once the oil is out there, it's too late to react because millions of gallons have been spilled. Well, you can use that as a metaphor for all other crises. So you have to be proactive. And the biggest factor holding back a proactive crisis management culture is that of defense mechanisms. In other words, the energy goes into the defenses rather than going into being proactively prepared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, we had this recent incident uh, with Twitter where uh, very prominent people's uh, accounts were hacked, uh, information was sent out, uh, Bitcoin requests were made, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I gather, and Someone said we were lucky that they only wanted money. Uh, they didn't want anything else. But I think the defense mechanism that you talk about, uh, I seem, seem to see that was in case. I think there was a sort of a, a, a more of a legalistic response. I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on, on, on that as an example. Well, if you have a, a proactive crisis prepared organ, they have a crisis management team. And on the team, you have all the major functions of the organization but no one of them can necessarily take precedent over the other. So if you respond just legally to protect the organization, I understand that, you may lose the PR battle. You know, as you were talking, we have the case of AI, where you can now make videos of people, prominent people, doing and saying things that they never would. So the point is, the cat's out of the bag. And what are we going to do to catch up? And, and I'm not necessarily talking for strict regulation of tech, but that gets to the last question is that, mm -hmm. let me go back and give some perspective. From 1972 to 1995, the Office of Technology Assessment was an adjunct member of Congress. Of Congress. It was used to provide, quote, objective scientific advice to Congress people so that they could make intelligent responses to whatever technical and scientific advances they were considering. It was disbanded in 1990, mainly for political reasons, because it got too hot, because it was, quote, seen as interfering. We need to bring back something like OT. I call it the Office for the Protection from Technology. Not that I want to hinder it, but we have to operate according to precautionary principle. In fact, there's another thing that is is in is in our history. Somebody proposed years ago a science court where people would get on and argue pro and con the merits or the demerits of a particular scientific advance. I think we need the same thing of a tech court. How it would work and everything, I don't know. But we need to explore that idea that before a major like CRISPR intervening intervening at the genetic level, that we argue not just the pros and cons, but how we would control it if it gets out of control. And that's what, it, but it needs to be explicit. You know, the one thing we've learned, we cannot depend on tech companies to self-regulate themselves. It just doesn't work because they don't consider all of, again, all of the dysfunctions, all the, all the abuse. Take this and disinformation. Facebook has turned out to be the perfect platform for the spread of disinformation, conspiracy theories, and the like. And what have we learned and what can we learn going forward to better ma manage technology? Not necessarily elim not eliminate that. That's about, we're in such a high-tech society. We would literally crash to a halt if we got rid of technology. I'm not talking about that. I'm a techie. I, that's not the point. But what is the social conscience that we will bring to better manage technology? Great, great, great. That was a great, great, great start. Um, what I want to do then is uh, turn this conversation toward uh, Melanie. And as I mentioned, she has a tremendous uh, 
background having worked at, at, at these companies. So let's see if we can uh, bring Melanie on, this, on the screen here. And as soon as I see her there, I'll, I'll plow in. Yep, great. But again, Melanie has a background at both uh, Uber um, and Facebook, and uh, I think is one of the best people to talk about the, the genuine experiences here. So, is, uh, is Melanie, are you on there? Yep, I'm here. Can you see me? Okay, great. There you are. Lovely to see your smiling face. Good. Um, sorry for I, I got the, the order of the introduction, but I think everyone knows what a great person you are, and I certainly had the pleasure uh, of meeting you at UC Berkeley and was impressed uh, with your experience. And it's such a delight to have you here. Um, so let me let you plow in. You heard what, what Ian said, but let me let just, just you open up with how you want to open up and then I have some questions for you as well. Sure. So, I mean, segueing off of uh, what Ian was talking about, you know, I, I come from the perspective of communication, right? So I'm often in the organization that is in fact responsible for a lot of the crisis management uh, within the context of managing the reputation of the company or of the organization. And one of the challenges that I often see, and I had mentioned this early on, is that we have some pretty perverse incentives, even for those of us who are you know, supposed to be the professional stewards of a company's reputation. Um, specifically, there is a lot of glorification of crisis management and crisis response and um, that kind of reactive approach that, that I had alluded to, we don't have a lot of incentives within our profession for crisis prevention. Um, so when I had talked about, you know, being able to recognize the early signs, um, you know, one of the problems that I see inside these companies is even when those signals present themselves, companies don't always do anything about it. Um, and those of us that are supposed to be responsible for protecting the brand and protecting, you know, the, the reputation of these companies, it's in our best interest to let the bad thing happen and come in to swoop it up as the, the superhero, because that's how we're promoted. Um, and mm. so I think that there's you know, a real problem with incentives, even for those of us who are supposed to be responsible for preventing these things. Because the you know careers are based on jumping into the fire rather than being the one that prevented it in the first place. Wow! 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 Okay. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of you know when we talk about technology, you know, there's so many emerging issues that are are, are coming out there. Everything from uh, you know Black Lives Matter issues to sexual harassment issues to, to whatever, but sort of how do you see these sort of emerging issues in this whole space? What do you what do you see that might be coming on out there? So, I mean, again, I'm looking at this front through the lens of, of my own profession of, you know, the, the team that's supposed to be responsible for all of your external engagements with your communities, your stakeholders, regulators, journalists, what have you. Uh, I'm actually hoping that over time, what we're going to see is that some of this crisis prevention particularly as it relates to more ethical um, specific issues, actually becomes a core competency of the profession. So one of the challenges that we have within the communications or public relations field is that there is no required ethical training or accreditation. Now, PRSA, which is the Public Relations Society of America, does have an accreditation program, but it's completely optional. And so unlike, say, like a lawyer, there's no way to like really be disbarred as a as a PR professional or a communications advisor for not advising your companies to to do the the ethical and, and right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm I'm hoping that this is something that you know there is a movement within our profession right now to make a bigger deal of this and to actually hold ourselves to account because. We can't expect the businesses that we advise to be able to have the same visibility and thought process that we have after decades of education and training. That is literally why we're in these organizations is to help them identify those red flags. And if we're not doing that effectively, then as individual professionals, we need to be held accountable for that. Right, right. Now, I know one thing in your experience um, is, you know, you've been in the hot seat you know, when something has happened. And the question I, I kind of is like, what is the, the, the diversity 
or mix of these teams. I remember when we, we first met, you, you told me that if you went into a meeting and was all guys with suits on, uh, <laughs> it, may not go, it may not go that well. But can you say something about, you know, the, the mix of people and teams and diversity of perspectives that are needed, you know, inside these organizations? Sure. I think one of the challenges, just first and foremost, especially if we're talking about technology companies in Silicon Valley, um, is that those of us that live in that environment are, we have a very different worldview than most of the people who are using our products or who are impacted by our products. And so I think first and foremost, there is not enough effort to educate Silicon Valley tech workers on what the global impact is of, of what we're building. Uh, and so I, I think that's a fundamental issue, right? E even if we had other pillars of diversity represented in that room, if you're building a global platform, you better have global perspective in the decision-making process, right? Uh, but the other problem is we have things like, you know, we have like trust and safety teams in all of these tech companies that are made of primarily men. I, I've I've sat in rooms where I was maybe one of two or three women and there's a whole bunch of men talking about women's safety issue and whatever feature or button they're going to build to protect women on their platform. And it's just dumbfounding to sit in that room and to think, what? <laughs> <laughs> this can't possibly be the way that we're going to make this decision. Uh, and as a result of that, truly, I think one of the most disturbing things that I've seen in some of these companies is the sheer lack of trying to actually study the problem and to actually understand what the issue is before a solution gets built. Um, there is so much focus on shipping as quickly as you can, launching as many features as you can, uh, because they're, they're conflating attention and publicity with influence and business growth. And so they're so eager to just build one button after another so that they have this laundry list of things to either show reporters or to show regulators of like, well, we built these 50 things. And what isn't happening is somebody who's looking under the hood and kicking the tires to go, did any of those 50 features that you built make a lick of difference? Because if not, you haven't actually solved the problem. And I think a lot of that comes to the fact that, you know, the diversity of thought is, is missing, right? It's not just a gender issue or race issue, but even just in terms of the different disciplines and perspectives that you bring into the room where, you know, often as a communications advisor, I have to ask all of the really uncomfortable questions because those are the questions that I'm going to be asked of by our external stakeholders. Uh, and so you can imagine if you don't have that person in the room, you might have a bunch of engineers and product managers who are super stoked about what they're going to ship because they haven't once thought about how they're going to defend it or explain it to someone else. Um, and, you know, for a lot of those products, there's simple tweaks like uh, obviously, you know, the, the misinformation stuff that that Ian is talking about in uh, regards to Facebook is a, a you know, a much deeper systematic problem about the, the business model. Uh, but some of these crises that we see, particularly the ones that are popping up in the media um, that aren't as kind of as big as, as misinformation, they're actually completely avoidable, right? Why did you file a patent for that technology that you have no plans to invest in, but seems really racist or problematic, right? Why did you even file that patent? Um, you know, because there are reporters who just watch those filings to, to try to speculate on, on what the business is planning. Um, why did you have to send that tweet as a company, right? Um, just all these little things that are so completely preventable. And again, the, the fact that there is no incentive. The, I remember um, quite a few performance reviews that I went through where you know, having to explain the difference between, yes, here are all the product launches that my colleagues worked on. Here's the giant laundry list of crises. You didn't have this half because I stopped an engineer from doing something that was well-intentioned, but dangerous. Um, and that was, that took some getting used to for every single boss that I had throughout my entire career because they didn't know actually how to evaluate the value of things that did not happen. 
Um, and it's one of the things that bonded me very closely to, you know, the, the internal clients that I had on the cybersecurity and privacy teams, because we shared that challenge, communicating our value to the business for the things that didn't happen because we were there and doing our job. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, once these things happen, I, mean, I have no idea, for example, the cost of this latest blow up with Twitter. Uh, but I would imagine they would have probably paid almost anything uh, to, you know, to have, to have avoided that. So that, that takes me to sort of the, the question we've been kind of trying to figure out how to, to get into, which is it changes in government policy or oversight. And, you know, as, as, as Ian mentioned, you know, no one's trying to say stop technology or, or anything like that. Um, but, there seems to be almost no space for genuine accountability after these things have gone on other than going to, to court. And then you maybe got a bunch of, uh, you know, agreements there that, you know, you, you, you've already signed up all your rights, but can you noodle at all sort of what would be, I guess, minimally effective? Of, where do we start in this space? Yeah. So I have a, a couple thoughts um, just to get us started is I think one of the biggest challenges that we have with policy and regulation of the, the tech sector in particular, and I think that it's completely understandable why we're, we're stuck in this rut, but it is a problem that we need to get out of, which is that we are so mad and so angry at these companies, and rightfully so, that we're almost too narrowly focused on laws and regulation that are strictly punitive. We just want revenge for what they've done to the world. Um, and I have to tell you, these companies, a lot of them have so much money and so much power. They will pay whatever fine they have to, um, to, you know, continue doing what they're doing. I mean, we're, we're seeing like Facebook's GDPR strategy in Europe is to just fight it through court, which is very expensive but they can afford to do that rather than actually have to change their business. And so one of the things that I would really like to see and where I think we could have more effective policy and regulation is really focused on what's the outcome that we want for the consumer? What is the protection or the right that we want to bestow on individuals um, and focus on that and you know, sure, there needs to be accountability and there needs to be, you know, holding these companies to account, but that is not sufficient for the type of changes that we actually want to see in proactively encouraging companies to do things differently. Because so long as the dangerous business models work in making money, it is always going to be to the disadvantage of the company to change before they have to. Um, and so mm -hmm, we really mm -hmm. got to look at laws and regulations that, you know, if you look at uh, things that happen in the automotive industry, right, with regulating seatbelts, right? So it was focused on what is, what is the protection, what is the outcome and the experience that we want for consumers and focus on that. That's what the, the law, the regulation needs to be. Uh, and then you can develop what the, you know, um, what the consequence will be for the companies that don't live up to that. But if we're too focused at the onset on just making companies pay for their mistakes, we're actually, you know, we're, we're missing what we actually want, which was, which is to protect consumers. Uh, Cause a lot of these companies have so much money, they'll just pay the fine. Right, right, right. I think the fine uh, for Facebook in the European union was like $5 billion. And I remember I was watching uh, one of the financial services and they said, oh, well, that's kind of a rounding uh, number for them. That's not going to, uh, you know, change, change, change very much. I mean, behavior. It, my concern is that w when it's just about the financial uh, um, consequence, that fine actually just becomes a cost of business rather than a motivator for change. And so the, and the change has to be focused on the individual and the consumer, not just on, you know, making the, the companies pay. Um, it, I, I would love if we could have both, but, you know, if, if we're just so focused on making them pay money or publicly embarrassing them, it, it, we're missing opportunities to actually drive change for the people that we care about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I guess that sort of fits into their space around 
well, how do you innovate these products and services in a way that the consumer actually enjoys them or, or uses them better so that you're almost going back to asking them, why don't you use all these skills that you have to basically make the product more amenable to what the consumer actually needs? And you'll probably give yourself some more space and stay out of trouble by, by doing that. Yeah, and I think part of the, the problem that we've seen, particularly with these larger companies, is that instead of building what consumers want or need, they put a lot of resources into convincing consumers that what they're being offered is sufficient. So we see a lot of bad behavior in terms of manipulation and dark patterns in product designs, even in California, where we have this new privacy law that you know, gives consumers the right to tell companies that they can't sell their data. So many companies have buried that control deep within a thousand different, you know, subdomains yeah. of their website. That's hard for people to find. And if you can't actually exercise your right, you know, it, the, that right can't protect you because you, you don't have the ability to actually to exercise it. Um, and so, at this point, you know, listening to Melody and Melody, it's, it's a very powerful presentation and argument that you make. You move me and I can't help. My anger was just rising. The more that you spoke, not at you, but there has to be some way. And I know this is going to sound really draconian of really looking at the business models of these companies. I don't know how or what it could be regulated by the government. But the more you talk, I real yes, they have almost unlimited funds. So the financial disincentives don't even matter. So therefore, there has to be some way of looking at what the harmful effects are in the business model. For example, when you look at all the presumed positive effects, so like take Facebook or whatever, they have produced the exact opposite. When I hear Zuckerberg say, we're not an arbiter of truth. Therefore, you're a conduit of falsehoods. And you have to look at almost how could every one of the proposed benefits turn into disbenefits and what are they doing to protect us, the consumer, from that happening? Now, how that would be enforced, I don't know. But it's reached the point, particularly listening to you, that I think we are that's bubbling up and we are inching towards that because the level of anger and dissatisfaction. I mean, look, it's betrayal on a mass scale. That's the, the one word that I would use. All the goodies that you have promised that are going to make our lives better, safer, all the rest of that have turned out. Are you going to connect the world? Well, my God, what you unleash in terms of untruths and all the rest of that. So we are deep into that conversation. Now, here's the other thing. Going back to what you were saying about the PR society, I don't know of any academic unit there may be or any professional unit that is looking at what you have raised, Melanie, and trying to come up with alternatives. And that seems to be so important. I'm disheartened that there isn't some serious body looking at what the alternatives are and not trying to make them draconian. Anyway, you're, I'm. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, that, that, in fact, that, that, that's a great segue to bring us all in together. Um, so let's see if we can get everyone in together. Melanie, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Great, great, great. If you want to respond to, to, to what Ian said, I also have a question for you from one of our listeners. But I'll, I'll give you the floor for a minute if you like. Sure. So one of the things that I was thinking as is, is I was talking about just kind of the, the disheartening uh, of the situation, I did want to share one area where I have seen some hope, um, with, you know, having been inside these companies, is that there is an increasing divide between tech workers and our executives. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the employees at these companies are increasingly number one, realizing that they themselves are being manipulated by the company. Um, and number two, realizing that they actually hold a lot of power. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, from Google to Amazon to Facebook to Uber, like all of these companies where employees are saying, my name's attached to that too. And I can't live with this decision. 
Um, and we used to see, I would say, you know, maybe even like five or six years ago, I would see so many people moving from company to company as they would run into those ethical dilemmas. And they would just simply say, I, I can't work here anymore. This doesn't fit my values, you know, what have you. I mean, that's why I left Facebook. But what we're seeing now is companies who are saying, I'm not leaving, you leave. Like, this is our company, we're doing the work. Um, we're building the products, we're making all this money for you. And we want you to change. Yeah. Uh, and so we, I do see a little bit of, of hope in terms of the, the tech workers that are organizing and are you know, speaking up against their executives to say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, let, let, let me squeeze in a question here yeah. from, our, from our listeners. Um, there's a question and it says that um, priorities are set by the board of directors. Uh, they focus on the financial results and shipping products, you know, because of the viability of the organization. Uh, how would you suggest addressing it at the board level? Is I guess the question. Melanie, you have any response to that? Sure, so this is actually a conversation that comes up quite a bit in the privacy community. Um, because for a long time, privacy was seen as um, merely a compliance requirement and just kind of like a, a, like a cost center, right? A necessary expense for running business. And what we're seeing is that privacy is actually a pretty strong competitive advantage. Um, and consumers and regulators are getting fed up with companies who aren't taking it seriously. And it's at the point now within the privacy community where we no longer believe that innovation without privacy should actually qualify as innovation. You know, if, if you're at the board level and you're setting the priorities, if the company you're overseeing can't build a product that is respectful <laughs> of society and, and the people that it impacts, they're not very good at building products. And there's going to be consequences for continuously ignoring those signals, as, as Ian has mentioned several times. You know, the, the crisis doesn't go away just because you've put your head in the sand. People aren't going to not be mad about this disinformation campaign just because you're used to defining what reality is. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's something that fundamentally has to change at the most senior levels of these companies is changing our own definition of what success is. What is innovation, right? If we build a product today and in six months, we're buried in legal fees or PR nightmare, what did we get for that product? You know, and so, so I, I do think that we have to change what we accept as innovation and what we accept as acceptable business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Following up, there's a, I guess, related sort of this whole question of corporate governance and corporate law, you know, is there, is there anything in that space uh, that we should be looking at in terms of accountability? Well, let, let me respond. In a few companies that I've seen, that I've gone in and I've been able to do a crisis audit of the organization, the CEO, if you get an enlightened CEO, in terms of the board said, I've got to make sure there's somebody on the board who's going to give me and us a hard time. I don't want just a bunch of people who are going to go along and say, yes, that's great and everything. But somebody, an ideal, let, let, let me give you an example. My wife, who has a PhD in childhood education, was working with a company. And they realized that although they were manufacturing products that were used solely by adults, kids were using them. Somehow or other, the light went on in the CEO's head and said, we have to hire a child development expert. If kids are going to be using our products and we don't know how they're going to be using them and what we can do, then we better hire somebody who's going to give us a good look at what kids think and so that we can be proactive. Now, that means, I mean, that's a real message there. That means hiring people. We're going to look at your stuff and from a completely different point of view, because we know about groupthink. We hire people that make us feel comfortable and reinforce our beliefs. That's not what the socially responsible tech company would do. So it would have an ethicist on the board, it would have a sociologist and even an anthropologist. I was fortunate to be on the board of counselors for CDC. And one of the things I learned that CDC has is medical anthropologists because you can't just go into a culture 
and give a vaccine without understanding the deep cultural norms. Well, that means you have to have somebody on your board that knows about cultural norms of your organization. I mean, that's that's just a mild reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let, let me throw one out there for you, for you guys, which is which has come up here uh, recently, which is uh, the expansion of these um, AI-based uh, facial identification systems. And in, I think in San Francisco, uh, they've been made uh, illegal. And, uh, you know, as an African-American, I know that one of the, the problems with these systems is they have a hard time uh, identifying uh, black faces, uh, black women have been misidentified. Um, but there was a case where, uh, you know, the product was literally, you know, sort of, uh, restricted in terms of market access, and I know there's a lot of a lot of fighting back. But you know, what about this? How do we deal with situations where we we think it's really prudent to re to restrict market access until these products are improved? I, I don't know if any of you have comments on that one as well. I, I have a couple of thoughts, uh, so I'll just throw those out there. Is one, I think it's important for us to know whether the discomfort we feel with these technologies is in their performance, right? That they don't work well or in what they're attempting to do, even if they did work well. So even if we were able to effectively identify everybody uh, through AI and facial recognition, should we, in what context and for what purposes should that be allowed? Um, and I, I worry that we are making decisions based on current capabilities of, the, of technology rather than thinking through, you know, again, what are the protections and what are the rights that we want to maintain for individuals in our society and just have a blanket rule that says you can't build something that does X. That's just not a, a thing that we are going to accept in our society. Um, and so, you know, I, I do appreciate, and I think it's the right thing to do to limit the use of technology, uh, particularly during phases where it is, uh, racist and discriminatory. Um, but I'm not more comfortable with facial recognition, even if it gets more performative and more accurate. Let, let me add on to that. The, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm proud to have been associated with is the uh, something called assumptional analysis. What we're talking about here are the key assumptions that are made about key stakeholders, how they will react and supposedly benefit from a technology. And the point is that we need to have a, one of the key points of crisis management is looking at the assumptions made and not made about key stakeholders. First of all, who are the key stakeholders? And that, that's why you need people with dramatically different points of view to be not just on the board, but be in the working heart of a company. And to challenge those assumptions, good company, the best, list those key assumptions and they say, what data do we have to validate or invalidate? Now, I know I'm laying out an ideal, but the point is, I, I agree with what Melanie just said. That's why I'm an advocate for the precautionary principle. That you know the the burden has to be now on these companies to not prove you can't do that, but to help ensure that this thing will indeed be a benefit. And when it's going south, what have you done to protect us from from those uh, from going south? Those kinds of things. It, mm -hmm. it raises the bar. It's not just enough to be technically competent or legal. It it the game is far beyond that. And, and I think even beyond that, Ian, is you're not technical or legally competent if you can't do this. That's like, right. Th that's part of the challenge that I, that I see, you know, with these tech companies is that it's really seen as an add-on to the core competency of, of their role. Yeah. And I'm like, if you as an engineer can't think through the consequences of what you're building, you're not a very good engineer. Yeah. And as a CEO or a board member, if if this isn't part and parcel of what you're doing, you're not competent. Well, you know, I'm often asked, you know, what is crisis management an add-on? I say, 
what program does the organization already take seriously as day-to-day -day business? And how can crisis management be a complement? For example, quality control. Because the, the, the point has been proved, we've had the data that crisis management doesn't cost, but saves money because it prevents crises that are too big to fix. That's the mental, that's the attitude that people have to have, not as a cost, but as a benefit to the organization. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think one very simple um, analogy that I think of is, you know, what, one of the things that, that I deal with day in and day out is just helping engineers communicate their own ideas, right? So whether it's through um, public engagement, you know, uh, public speaking, blog posts, what have you. Um, and so many of them start off developing their content as if they were the first ones to say whatever it is they're about to say. There is no history in, you know, computer science education that teaches them how to do like a lit review, <laughs> like the rest of us had to learn when we, when we took research courses. Yeah. Um, and so there, and that culture permeates throughout tech where there is no incentive to study what's been done, to really understand the space. Um, and the fact that you know, that should be part of your product development process. If that research and that investigation is not a required milestone in your product development, your product development is broken and doesn't work. And I think that's, you know, that's why I keep coming back to this point where we really have to change what we accept as competent um, because, you know, it, so many other disciplines have recognized that this is just the way to do good work. Yeah. It's not an extra. It, it's not an additional cost. Let me add if you're not doing it, you're not doing a good job. One of the key functions of a crisis management team is to do exactly what you're talking about. First of all, it's to make a list, a laundry list of all the kinds of crises that occur. And rather than saying, well, that category doesn't apply to it, like product tampering, say, what is the form that can happen to us? And what are the signals that it's heating up either in us or one of the other members of our industry? And not to discount anything. And also to say, how do we, look, one of the things that organizations often do, in fact, Facebook did it, it killed the messengers of bad news rather than rewarding them. And I agree with you, a hopeful sign is that the employees of the company are saying not enough. That's not the values for which we stand. So the pressure is gonna come from multiple sorts, not only internally, but externally. And it's gotta be persistent, can't let up. Mm -hmm. let, let, let me throw in a question here that I, I know is probably a really tough question because uh, I, I told my friends, this is my first pandemic, uh, therefore I can't be very good at it, right? Um, but I think clearly what's going on is some shifts in values, what people think is important, uh, you know, this, the whole, you know, what people want, demand, all that. And so I'm sort of looking at this and thinking as we go forward and as this new post-COVID world uh, is unfolding, you know, how do we think even social responsibility is going to shift? Because I know as you know, myself being a person who's, uh, you know, 65 years old, uh, you know, I'm in a high risk category of people who could get, get ill from this, but just the whole way we interact with one another and all of that, I think there's gonna be some shift and even how we define what, what social responsibility is. So I know that's kind of a, a no, no, not there no, question, no, but let, any let reaction? Me, let me say something on that because I have, in fact, I'm currently writing a book on the COVID and what we learned and haven't learned. One of the first things I would go back to is that public health officials have been warning for years of a major pandemic. They've conducted simulations, but the simulations were faulty. The simulations did not do what we're talking about today. They did not simulate all the crises that would follow from the pandemic, an economic crisis, an older population, vulnerable population, closing of schools, all the rest of that. In fact, one of the things that happened, you talk about a worst, worst case, no one would think of that simultaneous with a global pandemic would be the murder of an unarmed black man. George Floyd, because things don't happen in isolation. And it revealed the defects 
in how we think about these large social systems. I don't know of any agency around the world was looking at this as a whole systems problem. And if we've learned anything, yes, not only changing our individual behavior. I mean, I can see it as I go for a walk daily in our neighborhood, everybody wearing a mask, most people, and you can't get into a pharmacy or a grocery store. But the other thing we've got to learn to say, if a crisis happens like a global pandemic, what will it set off so we can act in advance to protect those systems? And if that isn't one of the key lessons from this, then I don't know what is. Well, and at the same time, I, and I, would, I would add that, you know, things like the systematic racism in the United States, yeah. um, that's not a moment in time. Um, and, you know, there weren't enough people looking and saying, this is a thing that is continuing to happen that we haven't properly addressed, that isn't fixed, that is still killing people. Any, any, any spark is going to ignite that, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's a number of those things constantly happening within a society and within a company all the time. These low murmurs that just keep going and never stop because we haven't actually addressed the issue. And so proper crisis management is identifying what gasoline do we have that's constantly yeah. trickling across our environment mm -hmm. where, you know, it, you know it, it wasn't just the murder of George Floyd. It was the fact that he wasn't the first or the second mm -hmm. or the Not hundredth, the right? Um, and so we have to be thinking about, you know, as organizations and as a society, what are those constant vibrations that we have yet to address that are just going to amplify any, any spark that, that well, falls until that, that, that issue is resolved? One of the things we didn't think about, if you have a COVID, and people are forced to stay home and shelter in place, turn on the news and could see the murder of George Floyd again and again, that this would set off a spark like almost never before and finally grab your consciousness for all the other murders of young black men. So that there were so many, see the point is most crises set off a chain reaction of other crises, particularly if you haven't planned for, but you're right. There are all these other things that are simmering. And now the slightest gasoline, the slightest spark can say, you know, if that isn't one of the big things we need to learn, God help us, literally. So, yeah. there's many, so the point is, you know, Gerald and Mel, as we've been talking, these things crisscross across categories because the categories aren't permanent. They don't give a damn where it starts. It's all interrelated. Look, one of my mentors, Russ Acoff at the University of Pennsylvania, appropriated the word mess to the hand for a whole system of problems that were so interrelated. You couldn't take any single problem out of the mess and analyze without doing irreparable harm to both the problem and the mess. We're in the realm of even worse, wicked messes. And very few people are almost, how do you cope with wicked messes? And that's what we've been talking about today. And technology is a part of it. Crisis management, denial mechanism, all of PR, the incentive systems. And we're now being thrust into managing messes as almost never before. Homelessness is a mess. It's not a single well-defined problem. And homelessness interacts with this. Anyway, we've been yeah. So well, I, one more question. And I question. think to your oh, earlier Mel point, Melanie, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I just I just want to give credence to something that that Ian said, uh, you know, earlier, which is that the, the reactive strategy doesn't work. If you're dealing with a mess, just like waiting for it to happen and then responding, it it, it's, it doesn't work. In fact, most of the re, like reactive response to a mess makes it worse. Makes it worse. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, you have to constantly be thinking about this all the time. It has to become the heartbeat of your organization to be doing this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the last question I want to get you guys to react to, which is in the space of, of transparency, right? So it's, it, I found it very interesting in the, in the Amazon case where a young African-American uh, man was fired because he was trying to stand up for some rights and possible unionization. But what happened was the comments about him by a lawyer in the firm were broadcast in the New York Times. 
and uh, it, it didn't make the company look very well. So you go with that, you go with cameras everywhere. I mean, the reason that we understood what happened to George, George Floyd was because it was videotaped for probably 20 to 30 minutes by a 17 year old girl. Well, right? let, let, me, let me give you a quick response that uh, number one, there are no secrets at all anymore. Anybody can find out just about anything about any person or organization. One of the things I've recommended as part of crisis management to virtually all organizations, hire an ex-investigative reporter to dig around your organization and write a scathing newspaper or CNN report showing you in the worst possible light because that's what will happen to you. And then what are you gonna do? to try and take care of that. But that's what you need. Again, somebody mm. who's used to digging for their and writing a very credible story because it will happen. And I would, I would take that even one step further to say your communications team should be serving that purpose in every single meeting and email thread that they're on. Yeah. Um, if, if your internal teams are not constantly faced with the questions they're gonna get from an investigative journalist, you know, something is going to fall through the cracks. I mean, when, when I started at, at Uber, you know, I, I told them, I was like, first and foremost, I, I don't believe in putting lipstick on a pig. Um, if you make a mess, you're going to clean it up. I, I can help you. Uh, but I'm, I'm not putting my name on your mess. <laughs> Everyone's going to know who's responsible for this. Um, and, you know, we had a pretty good working relationship for a long time. And it, it was because they enabled those conversations where, you know, I'm sitting with security teams, I'm sitting with privacy teams and product teams, and I'm asking them all of the questions that they never, ever want to ask or, or be asked. Um, and it's, and sometimes it's not even always malicious. It's, it's literally hasn't occurred to them, right? Which is the, this area of bias and, and this challenge that, that we're trying to deal with, right? And so, you know, I had a, a number of product teams who would come up with these proposals and I would say, you know, can you, here are the questions that I have that I think a reporter is going to ask me. Can you write a blog post that explains them? You know, I need you to explain exactly why you need more data. I need you to explain exactly how it's going to prove accuracy. Like I need numbers. I need formulas and not just this generic statement that you think it helps with fraud. Like I need to know exactly what is happening with this product. And, you know, a lot of times they would write the blog post and they would they were like, I can't put my name on this and publish it. And I was like, then we're not building the product. That is the solution. If you are so embarrassed by the truth of what you're doing, don't build it. But the only way that you can build that into the culture of a company is to have somebody with the backbone and the authority to sit in those discussions and call people out on their behavior. That is, that is fantastic. I'm so glad you're here, Melanie, because I thought you know, you have such a, a real world experience. And, you know, I just hope that the listening audience, you know, just takes advantage of, you know, just this, the, the wisdom you've shared, the wisdom that, that, that I am shared as well. So we're down to our last um, minute here. And so I want to give you, if you have anything else you want to add in a closing uh, statement or just something you want to react to, uh, you know, please do. Uh, before we go, again, I would like to, on behalf of the club, Thank the uh, Shan Zuckerberg Initiative for their support of the club and our digital platform. We appreciate their support. Uh, but yeah, any, any final comments you want to have? Well, I, I Ryan, would, anything you want to add? I would just add, I would uh, second everything that Melanie has said that uh, the point is it's not business as usual. It hasn't been business as usual for a long time. We're talking about a very different way not just of technology, but of managing organizations. And it calls for a different group of players. Again, I'll go back to the original statement. The skills that are required to invent a technology are not the same set of skills required to manage it, particularly to do it in a socially responsible way. And that means that all organizations have no alternative but to hire and to promote a different cast of character. One of the things I've heard responsible CEOs say when I've sat in the meetings that ask me the questions that I don't know the answer to and I don't want to hear. Tell me what I don't want to know, but what I need to hear. And that's the, and tell me something about the whole of the organization. One of the things they do 
when they have a crisis management team, they don't just have it with all the top officers, but they have people representing all the levels of the organization because they can see things that the top dogs can't see. Thank you so much, Ian. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> Me too. Melanie, too. are you good? Yeah, the, the one thing I just wanna add, I mean, for, for any tech workers or employees who, who are watching or, or view the recording, please don't give up. Uh, we need you. I know what it's like to be fighting inside the company. Um, it, it's absolutely critical um, that you keep up the fight. Uh, study social movement, study um, political science, uh, learn how successful activists have actually um, fought for change. Um, and, and bring bring those methods and those techniques to your organization because uh, it's absolutely critical that the employees inside these companies keep the pressure up. Great. So on behalf of my uh, team at the Technology and Society Member led Forum, I will say we will we will revisit this issue coming forward. But uh, thank you all for your presence. And this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is closed. Thank you very much, everybody. Hey, B. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Cheryl. Hey, before you, you go, Melanie, if I can be of help, and I mean this in any way, please call on me. I think we are on the same wavelength, and I hope that we would stay in touch and that we would continue the conversation. And that means the three of us, okay? I think you're both you're both stuck with me for the foreseeable <laughs> future. So <laughs> I'm not well, going anywhere. <laughs> I would appreciate it.